everyone, Boko Tov. Welcome to Mosaic. This is teaching number 37 uh, in the Mosaic series. And we're going to be primarily going back and forth between uh, Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 4 this morning. They're kind of uh, uh, the same accounts or same uh, period of time uh, in two different Gospels. Uh, so we'll kind of be flipping between them as we get the complete narrative of what's going on. Again, where we're at in the life of, of Jesus is uh, he's been baptized, he's been anointed, he understands his calling as the Messiah, he's gathered some early disciples, he's done a little bit of ministry at the festival, at a festival in Jerusalem, done some ministry in Judea, got some buzz about him, and he heads back to Nazareth in the Galilee, his hometown. Uh, people have heard about things going on with him. The this, this Jesus that was brought up um, in their midst. Uh, he speaks at a Sabbath synagogue service. Uh, some of it goes really well. Some of it's really well received. They desperately um, hear his message, definitely know uh, that he's one with power and authority. Uh, but then when Jesus kind of makes that shift of of when they want a sign or they want some of these things done in their midst, he compares them to the generation of Elijah and Elisha, where the immediate people that Elijah and Elisha were coming to rejected Elisha and Elijah. So they took that out to the nations and to the rest of the world, if you will. Uh, and they didn't really like that comparison that they were this rebellious generation, this stubborn generation. And so they took Jesus to uh, the high point of the city of Nazareth, uh, ready to throw him off the cliff, kind of the way they were ready to throw a Jonah off of the, the boat uh, to settle things down. Uh, then after that, Jesus leaves Nazareth and he goes to Capernaum, the city of Capernaum, where we'll spend our time today. And Capernaum becomes kind of the base of operation for Jesus over the next three years, essentially, of his ministry. Uh, Capernaum is even described in the Gospels as the hometown of Jesus because of this. And it's beginning the Galilean ministry of Jesus. Uh, soon we'll be getting into some of his deeper teachings, like the Sermon on the Mount and so forth. So that's where we're at contextually. Uh, let's bow our heads for prayer, uh, and then we'll lift up our Bibles. But let's pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, and grant that we would so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, so that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we would embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given to us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, in Mosaic, we love our Bibles. We value our Bible. The Bible is God's love letter to us. It is our lifeline. And so grab your Bible with you. Uh, if you need a Bible, don't hesitate to grab one in the pew or chair in front of you or around you. And if you need to make that your own Bible, then please accept it as a gift from us. But please lift your Bible up and repeat after me. This is my Bible. Jesus is who it says he is. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the word of God. My mind is alert. By God's grace my heart is receptive. The Bible is the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living Word of God. My encounter with the Bible today will transform and grow my faith. We say together, in Jesus' name, Amen. As I said, we're going to be flopping between Mark 1 and Luke 4 this morning, uh, but we will start in Mark chapter 1. 
uh, beginning at verse 14. And uh, just even as we're kind of going through Mosaic and we're in this teaching 37, if you'll notice right where that lands in the Gospel of Mark is still in the first chapter of Mark. Um, That's because of the way Mark's gospel is structured. Uh, It has no birth narrative. It has no pre-incarnation theology to it. Mark's gospel um, is on that first level, that Peshat level, uh, that that really just gets us the story of Jesus. Um, This is why uh, I'm often confused when I see uh, Bibles or Gospels of John's just the Gospel of John, and that's supposed to be like this evangelism tool that you're supposed to hand people. But to me, that befuddles me because the Gospel of John would be like the last thing someone who knows nothing about Christianity probably needs to be reading first, right? Because it begins with pre-incarnation theology. It begins with, uh, in the beginning was the Word. Well, what's the Word if you have no background in Christianity or the church? Whereas Mark's gospel is the one you want to hand people because it begins with, hey, there's this dude, he's about 30 years old, and he starts going out in the Galilee and teaching, right? And it just kind of kicks in right there. And in no amount of time, uh, you're already quickly in Mark's gospel at the passion and the cross and what it's all about. And so Mark's gospel uh, really uh, is just now for us around the week 37 of Mosaic is where we'll start really engaging in the gospel of Mark. So we're going to be looking uh, at verses 14 and 15. Again, this is Jesus. He's at Capernaum. He's in the Galilee. And we're having this shift because as we're going to read and as we've already discussed, John the Baptist gets arrested soon. John the Baptist meets his demise. And Jesus' ministry, if you will, is what supplants that, what takes that over. That's why so many of Jesus' first disciples were originally disciples of John. So let's read this, uh, these two verses together. After John was arrested, Jesus came to the Galilee and proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God. He said, the time is now filled full and the kingdom of God has arrived. Repent and believe the good news. So along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus essentially here is picking up the same message that his cousin John the Baptist had been preaching. Uh, Matthew's gospel uh, describes it this way in Matthew 4 verse 17. From that time, right, this time where Jesus comes to Capernaum, this time right after the incident in the Nazareth synagogue, um, that's why we call this the Galilean ministry. It's a distinct uh, division in the gospels. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near. It's in your face. When it talks about being at hand, it literally means uh, from the Greek, within a hand's distance. So as far as you can reach out your arm between there and the end of your longest finger, there is the kingdom of God. That's the idiom there. And that, of course, was John's message. And Jesus began preaching this. And he began to proclaim that the Messianic age well, it's, it's arrived, and even more than that, it was kind of the message of, so start acting like it. It's commenced, but it's not in its fullness. It's now, but it's not yet. And the way we bring it in its fullness, what Jesus will be spending so much of his time talking about, what so much of the Sermon on the Mount will be about, is now that the kingdom is here, now that the Messiah is here, now that the messianic age has dawned, let's start acting like it. That's the ultimate way the kingdom is brought, when we act like it. Uh, even if the messianic era has not arrived in its fullness, the arrival of Messiah, the arrival of that anointed one, the one anointed with the spirit of wisdom and uh, understanding and counsel and knowledge, The arrival of him has set everything in motion. The rest of Jesus' teachings, wherever they might be, wherever we are going to find him teaching, they are going to explicate and they are going to expound upon this central truth. That the kingdom is within your grasp. 
It's within you, as he will say in the Gospel of Luke. So start acting like it. And contrary to what sometimes we have found ourselves believing, the original gospel of Jesus was not believe in Jesus and be saved from damnation. Not denying the truth of that, but that's not what he's preaching at this phase. The original good news within the context of the gospels themselves was that because the Messiah is here, because the Messianic age has arrived, because the kingdom of God is at hand, Forgiveness is available. Redemption is available. Reconciliation is available. Repair is available. So repent. That's the way you grab it. That's the good news. That's the good news. That's the original OG good news. That the kingdom of God is within your grasp. So repent and take hold of it. Turn or return back to God and start living like you are in the kingdom. And as we're going to see, as Jesus goes out in his Galilean ministry and he uh, begins teaching this message, he will often teach in the open air. Sometimes he'll teach on a hillside. Sometimes he'll teach by the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Sometimes he'll be in a boat shoved out a little bit from the shore. But more often than not, the Gospels repeatedly tell us Jesus taught in their synagogue. All right. So he teaches in a variety of places, but the number one place that's mentioned over and over, as we even saw in like teachings 34 through 36, uh, was as was his custom, he went to uh, the synagogue. All right. That's where he did a lot of his teaching. So now we're going to flip over to, to Luke chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 31 in 32. Again, we're kind of looking, we've looked at Mark 1, Matthew 4, now in Luke 4, because our goal in Mosaic is that when all is said and done, in some way, in some fashion, in some way, we've gotten around and we've looked at every verse of all four Gospels, and we do that primarily when we see um, the same event or similar events happening at the same time. We kind of cover them together. So we're going to flip over to Luke 4. Again, this is the same description that we've seen in Mark 1 and in Matthew 4, that after that time in Nazareth, that he comes to Capernaum. So let's read uh, these verses together. He went down to Capernaum, a town of the Galilee, and he taught them on the Sabbath. They were astonished at his teaching because his word was a word of authority. All right, so again, teaching them on the Sabbath, that's implying the synagogue, obviously. So as I said, this is the start of the Galilean ministry of Jesus. And Luke tells us that Jesus began this ministry in the town of Capernaum. Uh, we learned last week uh, in teaching 36 that Capernaum comes from the Hebrew word kafar nahum, uh, the village of comfort or the village of Nahum. And uh, that is where, even though there, he's originally from Bethsaida, not too far down the road, uh, Simon Peter and his brother uh, live because uh, they have a fishing business there. Uh, and Jesus begins this ministry in Capernaum by offering teachings in the synagogue where he will teach nearly every Sabbath that he's in Capernaum. Now, the synagogue in Capernaum, that would be kind of like we might think of as Jesus' home congregation, uh, so to speak. And today, uh, these are the remains of a synagogue in Capernaum. We'll talk about is that Jesus' synagogue or not. The answer is no, but uh, it's pretty dang close, and we'll talk about why. But this, these are the remains. Uh, the Franciscans have excavated and partially reassembled uh, the remains of a beautiful 4th century, so around the 300s. Uh, synagogue that was constructed of ornate limestone. Uh, uh, it w had to be reconstructed because the synagogue that Jesus taught in, the synagogue that Peter would have went to, the synagogue that we read about in the Gospels, 
uh, was destroyed by an earthquake after the destruction of the temple. So after some time in the second century, there was an earthquake in the land of Israel, and it tumbled uh, the Jesus synagogue. But what's interesting about that is you think about this, especially uh, back when your building blocks and stuff were handmade. Let's say there was an earthquake and your stone building just kind of came down, but that foundation was still, that stone foundation was still solid. Where do you think you're going to build your new synagogue? Right on top of the old one, right? Right? And that's exactly what's happened. So here is a side view of that synagogue we just saw the aerial view of at Capernaum. And do you see the white kind of nice white limestone or light colored limestone? And then underneath it, you see those darker, smaller stones? That's basalt stone. That is Jesus' synagogue. That is the synagogue Jesus' feet touched. That is the synagogue you were reading about in Matthew 4 and Luke 4 and Mark chapter 1. They simply built the new synagogue over the foundation of the old synagogue. And the new synagogue is very much modeled after the pattern of all of those early century, including first century, Galilean synagogue. So it's probably pretty dang close to looking like that, other than that's limestone. Jesus' synagogue would have been a darker basalt stone, but that's the structure of it. That's the shape of it. Uh, It's literally built right on top of the foundation of Jesus' first century synagogue. So if you're ever able to go to Capernaum and you visit that synagogue, in one way you are standing where Jesus taught. You're just standing on top of some rocks that are standing on top of the rocks where Jesus taught. But that is the actual location. And in Jesus' day, that polished basalt stone was fairly new. It was kind of a new synagogue. Uh, Because as the Gospels tell us, a Roman centurion stationed in Capernaum had recently made a a large financial donation to sponsor its construction or its remodeling. And the new synagogue consisted of a long rectangular room made of basalt blocks. Elegant stone moldings and cornices decorated the synagogue. Rows of granite columns supported the high ceiling. And the synagogue faced south toward the Sea of Galilee because that for them was facing toward Jerusalem. So like today, if you were wanting to pray towards Jerusalem, you would largely pray east. It's not quite exactly east, but it's pretty much east. Well, in the Galilee, Israel, I mean, Jerusalem's not east of you, it's south of you. And so it was sort of put in a position where they would face Jerusalem when they worshiped. In the center of the room, the people would have stood or perhaps sat on the floor, and they also would have had bleachers along the side, stone bleachers that they could have sat on. And after his first Sabbath arrival in Capernaum, Jesus uses every opportunity that he can to teach in this space. Uh, The Capernaum locals, not unlike those that were in Nazareth, had already heard about this this teacher, this rabbi, this miracle worker, this prophet. And so they no doubt head over to the synagogue, and no doubt, as they did uh, in Nazareth, they see Jesus as that moftir, that one worthy of being handed the pulpit for the day. And so after the morning prayers, after the reading from the Torah and the prophets, Jesus would have sat down and began to teach in that space that you see there. Now, the Gospels do not provide the contents of this first Sabbath sermon in Capernaum. But he would have spoken on the weekly Torah portion and the, and the prophets. He would have expanded upon those texts to reach and surround his central theme that the kingdom of God is here. Repent, right? Because that's really what everything Jesus does centers around in his Galilean ministry. Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, no doubt, you can imagine being seated there or standing there, and they probably would have felt pretty proud uh, because this is their rabbi. This is their teacher speaking in their hometown synagogue. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, would have also been present. And the congregation at Capernaum, at first, seemingly receives Jesus' teachings well. 
In fact, this is how Mark describes it in Mark chapter 1, verse 22. Let's read that together. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, there's a couple of things going on there with how it's teaching us that he, that he taught with authority. What exactly did that mean in a first century context? So I want to talk about that. And then I want to kind of give you a hint at something that's even being said that's a little bit deeper than the first kind of understanding, though the first understanding is true. What this is first telling us is that when Jesus taught, he did not transmit what he was teaching in the names of teachers that had gone before him. And that may not sound like a big deal to you, but it was absolutely a huge deal in the first century. And in fact, it would still be a huge deal in Judaism today. That Jesus taught without transmitting what he was teaching through and in the name of teachers that had gone before him. In the classic mode of teaching in the first century Galilee, or even in the classic mode of teaching in Judaism to this day, one's credibility rests upon citing the traditions and the interpretations of the rabbis that have gone before you. And most notably, you will start with your teacher. Because that's one way I convince you, you should be listening to me. Because I'm going to tell you where my authority comes from. My authority comes from Yosef ben Haggai. And you're going to go, whoa, Pastor Chad was a student of Yosef ben Haggai. Yosef ben Haggai is a pretty important guy. And like was very influential and he wrote all these books. Pastor Chad knows some of the teachings of Yosef ben Haggai that weren't written down and that only his closest students know? Well, I want to listen to that. But then I will have to say, as my teacher Yosef ben Haggai taught me, and as his teacher Yitzhak Kadori of Jerusalem taught him, and as he heard from his teacher the Ben Kai of Baghdad, Right? I've just listed for you, one, I have actually listed to you my lineage, but I've listed to you like this powerful lineage of incredibly strong rabbis who had governed the people for generations. And therefore, your question that they had, like when Jesus was in Nazareth, remember we looked at those seven questions they asked? One of them was, where does this dude get the authority to do this and say this? Because Jesus didn't give that, right? And so that was common, and that would have been expected. And so Jesus is saying, look, my authority... It isn't resting on the scribes and those who've gone before me. I'm not teaching in the name of someone else. Instead, Jesus will almost always, when he does attest why he's teaching or whose authority, he will cite his father. He will cite his father. Eventually, we will find out who Jesus' earthly teacher was, and we will find out when he does sort it as a place of authority, but we haven't got there in the Gospels yet. For now, their response is this. That guy got up there and told us a lot of stuff that was powerful and amazing, and it convicted me, and I felt the spirit move. It was an amazing teaching, and yet it's, it's his. It's his. He didn't get it from anybody. That's their first response, that he's unlike the other teachers of his day. That he speaks essentially at this point and from their perspective at this early juncture in the Galilean ministry, he speaks of his own authority. That's controversial. Uh, he doesn't need the opinions of earlier generations. And he doesn't have to speak in the name of previous rabbis. And again, we'll hear this when we get to the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said... And I say to you, right, same kind of thing going on there. He's making these pronouncements, stating his interpretations, his understanding and applications of the Bible confidently and matter-of-factly, speaking more like a prophet, speaking in the name of God himself, more so than just a sage or a scholar of the Torah. Now, there's something else going on. It's a word play. And that is one of the primary ways we know or we will discover in Mosaic. We, have, we don't know that yet if we're 
truly discovering Jesus because he hasn't started doing it for us yet, we will discover one of the ways Jesus teaches, one of the prominent ways he teaches is through parable, through the parable. The Hebrew word for parable and the Hebrew word for authority are almost identical. And they come from the same root. Uh, because someone who's teaching a parable is someone who is teaching with authority because uh, someone who's teaching the parables, the storyteller is the one who has the wisdom gathered, who knows how to apply the wisdom and the experience and the word of God and all of this and put it in a story so that people can grasp it. The storyteller does have authority, and so they're related. And so it's a wordplay. So it's not only, you could easily translate this as they were amazed at his teaching because he was teaching them as one with parables and not as the scribes because the scribes of Jesus' day did not teach primarily in parables. They primarily taught um, in what would be called halakha. They primarily taught in do's and don'ts and, and ethics and very much listing out how you should live your life and what the rules of behavior are. It was very, very much... Um, expository from the Bible. And Jesus isn't doing that. Jesus is doing uh, his teaching with authority. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a word play that you can't catch in English, but it's there in the original. He also is teaching them with these parables. Again, with authority. It's an intentional kind of double entendre there uh, that you can just kind of pick up on when you know the original language. And we're going to see that that's actually the case as we continue to get to know Jesus and his teachings. So let's read more about what's happening this day in the synagogue in Capernaum. Uh, let's look at Luke chapter 4. And we're going to look at verses uh, 33 through 35. Uh, so let's uh, read this together and I will... Uh, skip the screen. I'll go over the screen because there's more than this is one screen. So let's read. In the synagogue, there was a man who had in him an unclean spirit. He cried out with a loud voice saying, alas, what do you have to do with you? What do I have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus reprimanded it saying, be silent. And come out from him. The demon threw him down in their midst. It came out from him without doing any harm to him. So as Jesus is bringing his teaching, his powerful, authoritative, original teaching and use of the parable to a conclusion, a shrieking voice rips through the quiet Sabbath morning. And here we can also learn of the power of God's word, right? The power of God's word doesn't only move hearts and minds towards God, but it can also disturb those contrary to God, okay? And so um, a man from the back of the synagogue begins to wail, what business do we have with one another, Jesus of Nazareth? That's Mark's version, Mark 1, verse 24. In rabbinic terminology, Demons are called unclean spirits, uh, literally ruach tumah, right? An unclean spirit. The Judaism of the day of Jesus believed that these spiritual entities would vex human beings, that it was almost um, the way I would kind of think the way it was viewed was the way we view germs today, right? If someone is sick and coughing, you, you kind of know you don't want to be around them because what might happen? You might catch it, right? They kind of viewed the spirit of being against God or against the things of God or um, being antagonistic to God's will or God's people or being antagonistic to the good or to the holy, that there was almost like this, again, this ruach, this, this, this unclean spirit that if you associated too closely with would contaminate you, that you would then catch and that it would then vex you. Uh, Josephus, first century the, uh, historian, when he was writing about uh, King Saul of the Old Testament's condition, he said this, quote, strange and demonic disorders came ab about him and upon him and brought him to a place of suffocation where he was almost being choked. 
Of course, it's not literal, but it was describing the, the spiritual attack that happened to King Saul because if you read the story of King Saul, he began to associate with some of the darker side of spirituality. He began to dabble in things that he should not have dabbled in, and because of that, he caught, he caught this vexing spirit. And it troubled him and influenced him uh, to the point of his destruction. First century Jews, those that would have been in that synagogue of that day, uh, considered these types of spirits as being responsible for a whole host of ailments. Physical ailments and maladies, sicknesses, mental disturbances, disabilities, seizures, you name it. That's what they understood it as its source. According to the Talmudic era uh, Jewish theology, these spirits lurked everywhere, not only in dirty and ritually impure places, but also, and this is a, a quote that uh, reminded me of a quote that Dr. Martin Luther once said, and that is, wherever there's a church, the devil builds a chapel next door. Uh, and the idea of that is, is that uh, the evil one, it, it doesn't really need to go to the dirtiest, seediest, darkest parts of town because those are already kind of deep, dark, and seedy. Where does he need to go to do damage? Damage has already been done there. Where does he need to go to do damage? Right here. Right here in the midst of holiness. And so wherever you're going to find holiness, wherever you're going to find God at work, you can best believe, and you see it here. You can see it right here. Biblical proof of it, but you can see it throughout the scriptures. You're going to best believe if holiness is active, the backside of holiness is also building its chapel nearby to thwart the advance of that holiness and that goodness. And that's, you can see that in the, that, that response. Like, what are you doing here? Like, what are we, why are you here? Why are you bothering me? I've got a good thing going here. I'm starting to make headway. I've already, I've already influenced this guy. I'm already making headway in Capernaum. And I don't need you because I know who you are. Notice that spirit knows who he is in fullness. Everybody else hasn't figured it out, but he knows. Well, I know who you are, so what's up, right? Which also hints to the fact that this spirit knows something of some kind of timeline, right? Just as Jesus, when he will say things like, don't say this, don't tell them, my time hasn't come yet, the appointed time has not arrived. To some spiritual level, there's that timeline, and this spirit knows it and is thinking, aren't you a bit early for this? Uh, you know, I'm thinking I still had a little bit of time left. You've kind of caught me off guard, this one from Nazareth. And so his question, what business do we have with one another? What business do you have with me? It's a, it's a Hebrew idiom for really, don't mess with me. Don't meddle in my business. Leave me alone. And the Spirit asks, have you come to destroy us? Notice it's in the plural. In a future teaching in Mosaic, we will expand upon why it's an us, why it's a plural. Uh, for now, just take note of it. He's surprised to see Jesus. He's surprised to see the Messiah. He's surprised to see that all of this is happening because his understanding of the timeline in the spiritual realm is that he's got a little more time left. And maybe he's, he's thinking of the, the Passion Week. Maybe he's thinking of the culmination of the end of all ages. We don't know what's in his mind, but it wasn't this. It wasn't Jesus being in Capernaum in the synagogue on that Sabbath day. Jesus really doesn't engage the conversation which is an important lesson for us as well. Sometimes when we know we are facing something that's dark or devious, um, that conversation isn't needed. We don't need to engage it. We don't need to enter into it. Instead, he simply says, be quiet and come out of him. The man collapses. The spirit leaves with a shriek, and the man is unharmed. Now, one of the reasons this would be in the Gospels is not just because of the miracle of it or to show Jesus is powerful in the spiritual realm, all of which is true and all of the other things we've heard about this story. In Mosaic, I try not to just revisit what I think you probably already heard in a pulpit before. 
I want you to understand it's in here because, and this ties beautifully in with today's sermon, as we look at Jesus in the sermon as being the son of Solomon. This is in here because it's the story itself for our purposes and for the original reader's purposes is to say that, that Jesus is the son of Solomon, that he is David's son. He's David's greater son. So why would the gospel writers want us to think of Solomon? And you may not have, but you should have. And that's because Solomon, King Solomon, mastered the art of exorcism. And King Solomon mastered the arts of commanding spirits. In fact, you can even find some are fake. So again, this is a do not Google because Google will mislead you and take you down horrible paths that you should not go. All right? But there are things called the Seal of Solomon. Again, there are a bunch. And whatever you Google, I promise, won't be the Seal of Solomon. Solomon supposedly had these seals, and on it had the language of the angels, and on it he could command the spirits. That was part of how he was trying to bring in the messianic era. Solomon, as David's son, was trying to usher in this messianic era. And so to do that, he used his wisdom and his knowledge to have mastery over the spirits. And uh, the stories, again, the stories that would have been familiar in the hearts and the minds of the people in that synagogue that day were that all the spirits bowed before Solomon and they, they feared him and they obeyed whatever his voice said. In fact, Josephus describes Solomon's techniques for exorcism and he even describes a first century exorcism performed in Solomon's name. And so when Jesus does this, one of the things he's doing in its cultural, contextual point is he's showing himself to be, in fact, the son of David, the son of Solomon, the new Solomon, the one who has taken the authority just by his voice over the spiritual entities. And so the people of Capernaum, Yeah, they would have picked up on that. And that's another way Jesus is making a messianic claim without just saying, hey, everybody, I'm the Messiah, right? Anybody can stand up and go, hey, everybody, I'm the Messiah. Not just anybody can stand up and take what everybody knows as someone who is off balance, who is disturbed or angry or however you want to describe this individual that is very unsettled, not just anybody with just a few calm words can nip that in the bud and restore that person to wellness. In fact, we only know one other person in history that can do that, and that's Solomon. And so now here's the one who's come in the line of Solomon, in the line of King David from the tribe of Judah. It's a messianic claim. That exorcism is a messianic claim identifying Jesus as the new Solomon. So let's keep reading. We're going to flop back to Mark chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 27 through 28. So let's read this together. Everyone was alarmed, and each man asked his neighbor, saying, What is this? What is this new teaching that he even commands the spirits of impurity with power? And they listened to him. And the news of him quickly went out into all the areas surrounding the land of the Galilee. You see that phrase. He commands the spirits of impurity with power, and they listened to him. That is the exact phrase that Josephus and others describe of Solomon. It's the exact phrase. So again, it's, it's, it's this Davidic, Solomonic claim to the throne to be the king because he has the attributes of the king. And so... Obviously, this gets alarm. Undoubtedly, this was probably the most exciting thing that anyone remembers ever happening in the Capernaum synagogue, a Sabbath service not soon to be forgotten. So the people are claiming, what is this? A new teaching with authority, right? Rabbi Lichtenstein explains that the people of Capernaum 
associated the teachings of Jesus with his power. And I read a quote from Lichtenstein's commentary, quote, It appeared to them that in this new teaching there was great power, the power to do miracles and to control the spirits. For in the thinking of the Jews of the time, every miracle done by a Zadok, a righteous person, was only done through the power of the teaching of the Torah itself. So what they would have also understood was that this is someone who's mastered the Word of God, who knows everything the Word of God has to offer and knows how to use it as a weapon and as a tool, that that's, that's where they get their strength from. That's where a Zadok, a righteous person, would be able to do this. Uh, and so the people in the synagogue understood the miracle. They understood the authority wielded by Jesus They also understood the kind of heavenly, Davidic, kingly Messiah endorsement. Uh, And Lichtenstein points out a similar reaction in Mark 6, verse 2, which pairs Jesus' teachings with his miracles when they say, what is this wisdom given to him that such miracles are performed by his hands? Again, that wisdom coming from an intimate knowledge of the word of God. And so now, let's uh, flip back to Luke chapter 4. All right. That's that's how we're going to get every verse in the Gospels done, right? Luke chapter 4, verse 38, reading in Luke's account of this same account. Uh, Let's read together. He arose from the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. That's Jesus. So after after quite the exciting uh, service, he gets up and goes to the house of Simon. That's Peter. Simon, Peter, and Andrew invite Jesus and the sons of Zebedee uh, to their home after the service for what is known as the second meal of the Sabbath. The Sabbath has uh, three meals associated with it. This would be the the three meals. This is one of those meals. Uh, And then Mark chapter 1, verse 29. Immediately after they came out of the synagogue, right? This is Mark's version of what we just read in Luke. They came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon Peter's house was soon to become the center of Jesus' ministry in the Galilee. When in Capernaum, the disciples stayed there. And while foxes have holes and birds have nests, the Son of Man does not have any place to lay his head. But nonetheless, he had regular accommodations with Simon Peter at his house whenever he was in Capernaum. In fact, we'll see a picture of what, uh, as early as the uh, mid-2nd century, was already marked as the bedroom Jesus slept in in this house uh, because this house has been discovered. Uh, Just to take a quick note, there are at least 11 events that happen in this house. And up there, I give you some of them. The, The gospel incidents in Simon Peter's house, right? You have the healing of Simon's mother-in-law, the healing of sick of Capernaum. Jesus spends the night there. He heals and teaches. The paralytics lowered through the roof there. The first assembly of the 12 disciples as the 12 is in that house. Jesus' mothers and brothers visit there. Jesus conducts private teachings there. Uh, He's asked to pay the temple tax there. He picks up Simon's child there. He teaches on marriage and divorce there. And I give you all the references, almost all of them, from Mark's gospel. But that's just a sampling to to show this becomes the base of operations for the Galilean ministry of Jesus. This house sits only a few dozen yards south of the synagogue. When you come out of that synagogue, you literally see kind of a cardo, a main street, a main street that Matthew would have been, had his booth on, his collecting taxes, and then across that street, is Peter's house. And then right on the other side of Peter's house is the Sea of Galilee, right? And that's why it says immediately when he comes out of the house in that Mark text, it's literally like from here to the community center, right? Boom. I mean, as soon as you come out there, you're almost in Peter's house. And Simon Peter's house, as I said, not only became the base of operations for Jesus' ministry, it became essentially a sanctuary, It became essentially a church for the Jewish believers of Capernaum. And that's today uh, what Simon's house looks like. Um, And 
I think I told you last week, Capernaum got kind of the, the bad name, if you will, of being filled with witches and sorcerers in the second and third century. It wasn't filled with witches and sorcerer, sorcerers. It was filled with Jewish believers in Jesus, right? And so the Jewish opponents, that's how they describe those people in Capernaum, right, as witches and sorcerers. They were believing Jews, and Simon's house becomes essentially one of their main gathering spots for worship. Um, under the direction of uh, Joseph of Tiberius, a very famous early Jewish believer, they built uh, a basilica essentially around it. And then uh, one of the oldest travel journals we have of the Holy Land, uh, it's a fascinating read. Uh, this person left Europe in the 300s, and they went to the Holy Land on a pilgrimage. And they wrote all about what they saw. It's fascinating because it gives you what the Holy Land looked like in the 300s. And this is what this pilgrim wrote um, about Peter's house. Quote, The house of the prince of the apostles in Capernaum has now been changed into a church. The walls, however, they are still those of Peter's house, and they are standing just as they were. End quote. A century later, Byzantine uh, Christians encircled that with another larger structure. So it's like a house and then a church and then a church around that as it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, can't imagine a church having uh, campaign programs to have a bigger campus or anything, right? Uh, but nonetheless, they do that. And the archaeologists have excavated the remains of all of these all the way to getting to the first century Jewish house that all of these churches were preserving. The remnants of Peter's house appear to be in every way typical of a first century Jewish home uh, in Capernaum, a uh, common insula uh, composed of roof clusters. Uh, on your handout, I give you a couple of artistic designs of what that first century uh, home looked like. Also, there's lots of graffiti scratched into it. And not just that Jack loves Diane and things like that, but it's graffiti in Syriac, which is Aramaic, uh, as well as uh, an older form of Aramaic, Hebrew and Greek. And you can date because of penmanship and the level of the patina and all these things when these graffiti things were written. And many of them were late first century, early second century. And they say things like this. Lord Jesus Christ, help me. Uh, or, or, and then it lists a, a person's name, or Christ have mercy, or Messiah have mercy on me. Uh, but kind of like prayer requests left in the wall. Uh, they found fishing hooks from the first century, all kinds of things from this. It's, it's an amazing sight. Um, but we are running out of time, so we're going to end there with our time in Capernaum. But we aren't done with Simon Peter's house or what's happening in that house on this Sabbath in Capernaum. 